own sphere's been out for over 10 years now, so this is pretty unnecessary, but nonetheless, spoilers ahead. The story of Odin Sphere is one that I don't necessarily feel the need to weigh in on, save for certain specific elements. A question crops up during the confrontation between Oswald and Skaldi. During this sequence, Skaldi tells Oswald that the sorcerer Beldor had told him about Oswald, and that Skaldi had, quote, I've invited your family here for a little reunion. Before three bugbear mid-bosses appear in the scene. The specific question to be begged here involves the use of the word family. One interpretation is that these are brethren, in a sense, of Oswald. This is because Brahm mentions that the bugbears are the spirits of former Beldereaver wielders. Many have been taken by the sword's curse and have been turned into ghosts. What fate awaits Oswald? That blade will take its wielder to the netherworld where he loses his soul. Those revenants up in the mountains, they are former users of the Belder River. And if you fight the Inferno King Onyx as Oswald during the Armageddon sequence, Oswald actually turns into a bugbear himself. Logans, stand back. Lord Onyx. He has lost his power and his identity. His soul has been devoured. However, it's also theoretically possible that these are literally the twisted souls of Oswald's parents. One thing to consider is that while three bugbears are shown in the scene, only two appear in the actual fight, unless you're playing on extra new game. Another thing to keep in mind is that Scully knows how to traverse the netherworld and could very well know ways to summon and corrupt spirits. Another point in favor of this theory is the fact that he explicitly states that Beldor told me everything about you. Before the line concerning his family. For one, he wouldn't need to know everything if the only connection that mattered was him having the Beldery. And two, given their advanced age, it's very possible for the wise men to have been around when Edgar left Titania, Oswald was found by Melvin, and brought to the Fairy Kingdom. In Chapter 6, Act 2 of the Fairy Book, Mercedes makes a note that, quote, the Demon Lord's troops are behaving strangely. Looking at the chronology of events as a whole, this happens right after Ingwe turns into the Darkova to attack Odin in Velvet's story. Meaning that because Odin was placed in such a vulnerable state following the attack, this is likely the very moment when Odette sent the spirit of Lord Brigan to possess Odin, given that Gwendolyn's fight with him precedes Mercedes' final confrontation with Odin. Speaking of Mercedes' story, another moment where events cross paths is in Chapter 4, Act 4 of the Fairy Book, where Urzer says, quote, Here she comes, the evil fairy who cursed our kingdom. This line feels cringy and out of place, but if you look at when it takes place, this is the point in Cornelius' story when Edmund is being pressured by the three wise men to tell them the secrets of Darkova by sacrificing citizens to Belial, while also claiming that the king is responsible for the brutal and draconian laws being forced upon the people. Then, in Chapter 5, Act 6 of the Fairy Book, wherein Mercedes is conveniently saved from encroaching Halia when King Gallen suddenly has a massive temper tantrum, the reason for this isn't random. This event takes place at the same time as Ingwe calling on the power of Darkova to attack Odin. This relates to a conversation concerning what I consider to be one of the most interesting characters and curiosities concerning the story, King Gallen. During Cornelius' story, he encounters King Gallen in the Netherworld and mentions his words near the end of Cornelius' story. When I met him, I know he asked me, please let me rest. Gallen does not wish to repeat his past atrocities. This notion is reinforced by a scene that takes place between Scully and Gallen. Oh, King of Titania, it is I. Be gone, you demons. I have already declined your request. Great King, although you do not wish it, we will one day release you.
Yet during the Armageddon sequence, he relishes in destroying not only the world, but his very own kingdom, son, and grandson. A far cry from the context given by Cornelius. Do you take me for a saint? This rapture, this joy, you will soon understand it. I believe that this is reconciled with several different scenes and lines. The first concerns the one with Galen himself in the Netherworld just prior to the events of the Armageddon. Let me show you the Darkova. Relive Titania once again. There it is again. Someone is calling upon the power of Darkova once more. Stop! My blood is boiling. But the anticipation awakens a sick pleasure inside me. My heart is growing dark. This tells us that the power is still connected to him, and that was the reason why he suddenly acted out the first time in Mercedes' story. The second concerns the scene prior to this, where Ingwe speaks of his lack of control when it comes to Darkova's influence. The spell of Darkova is still affecting me. I knew it would happen, but my heart is tainted. I can't bear it. Like a wolf, my hunger eats away at my very core. Velvet, not even you are safe from my appetite for human flesh. With the third scene depicting Beldor and Ingwe prior to fighting Darkova as either Gwendolyn or Oswald. So that even if Darkova went completely mad, we would still be able to control it. The implication being that the three wise men feared that the Darkova might kill them even if they were working with it. That the power corrupted to such an incredible extent that none would be able to reason with it. This scene is also reinforced by the things said by Valentine and Galen himself, with Valentine saying, King Galen must have wept in his cell. In addition to killing his own citizens, <laughs> he was slain by his own son. And Galen saying, Destiny tricked me again. referring to his attempt to use the power of Darkova to repel the armies of Valentine, only to then turn on his own people and force Edmund to strike him down. The power of Darkova is an interesting point of contemplation, along with King Galen himself. One thing to note about Galen is the nature of the royal secret mentioned when Oswald confronts him in Titania. The secret being that Galen was apparently fated to die only at the hands of someone of royal blood. This is something that is referenced far in advance with a note titled Two Princes and the Treasured Sword, which as a note, didn't exist in the original Odin Sphere. In it, Edgar acquires the sword Cornelius ends up wielding in the game and accidentally injures King Gallen, albeit with a very minor cut. The lethality of the blade, knowing that he was fated to die at the hands of someone of royal blood, and likely feeling frustration that Edgar wanted to marry a commoner rather than a princess, culminated in an outburst of rage that ended with Edgar renouncing his heritage and fleeting. Fearing the resentment that he no doubt felt towards King Galen, even though the sword remained in Titania's possession, he ordered his son to be assassinated. To me, the most curious and fascinating prospects by far concerned the relationship between Titania and the Netherworld. A major connection concerns the Book of Transformation mentioned by Skaldi to Velf and Urzer to Edmund, both copies of which held information regarding Darkova. Both were separate texts, and the Titanian one was written not by the Three Wise Men, but a member of the Titanian royal family. What's more, while the Three Wise Men gained access to the Valentinian Book of Transformation early on, they and Ingwe continued to seek out the Titanian text, indicating that whoever wrote it was far more knowledgeable on the subject. More substantively, however, are two very important statements made by Ingwe and Beldor. During the confrontation between Ingwe disguised as Cornelius and King Edmund, Ingwe requests knowledge about, quote, the royal family's secret power, presumably referring to Darkova, with the connection cemented with the scene that plays after fighting the first Armageddon boss as either Gwendolyn or Oswald, wherein Beldor muses it seems that the user must be Titanian royalty if the power is to work properly. 
So what do all these references to Darkova have to do with the Netherworld? Recall the words that Urzer speaks to Velvet after the boss fight in Titania in relation to Darkova. Tis a secret technique that allows the user to gain the power of the Netherworld. All of these story elements seem like they link Titania and the royal family specifically to the Netherworld, with the obvious question being to what extent. Well, there's no way to know, but it's possible that the royal family descends from a lineage that once called the Netherworld home. Something to consider is the architecture capable of being seen in the background of Odette's combat stage. The pillars and other structures lie slanted and in ruin, and appear to be signs of a past civilization. A civilization that I think both Odette and the Titanians might once have been a part of. It's possible that Odette discovered a tremendous power that granted her dominion over the Netherworld, and through the connection bridged with the world of Arion that she referenced after her fight with Gwendolyn, either cast out, merely allowed the Titanian royal family to leave, taking the knowledge they possess with them, or perhaps they escaped. The living and the dead could exist in this land, because I bridged the gap between these two worlds. Now, why would these structures not be something that Odette herself created slash ordered the creation of? Or isn't it very much possible that Vanillaware likely just put them in the background so that it wouldn't be as boring and it didn't mean anything at all? Well, for one thing, consider the vanity that Odette appears to exhibit. She maintains a flesh-like face and torso. When meeting with Ingwe, the two also comment on her appearance. Beautiful queen of night, please reign your anger. I would be even more beautiful if I rouged my face with your blood. Melvin also flattered her appearance in the contract that offered Oswald's soul. And then of course there's her love of jewelry that made her bring Brom the blacksmith to craft, and her hatred for Odin's theft of the crystals. You will continue to serve me by crafting your wonderful jewelry. That is what your life is for. Let's also not forget her desire to covet and control the souls of both the dead and the living that have been promised to her. Surely a woman so prideful of appearance, covetous, and protective of property would want structures meant for her to be maintained, would she not? As for the other possibility, yeah, that's more than likely the case. Doesn't mean a mofo can't theorize, though, damn it. Another interesting point of contemplation to me is the nature of the ancient crystals. Considering the fact that they're blue, are consumed when their effect is used, and phosons are supposed to be representative of life, it's easy to see them as netherworld crystals created specifically to release phosons to bring someone back from death with the caveat presumably being that it only works if present right when an individual would otherwise die and keep their soul from crossing over and being trapped in the netherworld. Hence why neither Odin nor King Valentine ever brought Ariel back from the dead with one. Speaking of Ariel, the mother of Velvet and Ingwe, the answer of the question, why is her soul never encountered by any of the characters in the Netherworld, can be attributed to her essence becoming Phozon Crystals, and that she simply passed on a second time before Odin found a path into the Netherworld, and King Valentine had been killed in the Cauldron's Rampage. Going back to the topic of Ancient Crystals, as a note, they may share a connection with Titania and or Valentine. This is a really flimsy piece of evidence, but it's at least worth noting that a note found in the original Odin Sphere talked about the currency of Arion. In it, it talks about the gold mines controlled by Titania and Valentine, which is why they minted gold coins. Given that the ancient crystals appear to be set in gold, it's another potential connection between these nations and the Netherworld. Those are my theories on things but it's worth noting that I know very little about Norse mythology, and given all the references to it in this game, it's very much possible that some of these story elements were meant to parallel and reference something from Norse mythology that I'm just not aware of. For this last bit, I'd like to point out a couple things. One of the nitpicks that was a sticking point for me concerns the confrontation between Cornelius and Mercedes. 
Given the point in the story when the encounter takes place, Mercedes's voice acting, at least the English version, I can't speak for anything concerning the Japanese voiceover, has her presenting herself in a confident and commanding manner that she doesn't come close to having until much later on. This was no doubt the result of a significant oversight either in the voice acting direction or the notes given to those directing the voice actors. There's also something concerning King Valentine that should be addressed. The question of why he never escaped if he was able to enter and leave in the past I believe can be explained in two scenes. The first involves the scene after Velvet's fight with Odette near the beginning of her story, when Scaldi teleports himself out at the end. The second concerns the scene that follows Mercedes' defeat of Beldor, wherein Ingwe curses Beldor before he can cast a spell on Mercedes. Ingwe states that he will never be able to use magic from that point onward because of the curse. Since King Valentine was also cursed, it seems reasonable to conclude that magic was the means by which Valentine both entered and left the Netherworld, rather than using the path Odin and the Three Wise Men discovered. Then again, that certainly doesn't explain why he's seen using magic several times after leaving the Netherworld in both Cornelius and Velvet's stories. And that scene with Cornelius talking about his powers being sapped from the Netherworld doesn't explain why Beldor couldn't use his magic or why Odette would let him escape in the first place. Oh, hell, screw it. The dumbest moments from my perspective were during the end of Mercedes' story when she recalls her mother's words, I cannot look down. While looking down. Yeah, I know it's a visual cue meant to communicate that she's focusing internally. But dumber than that is when she says to Odin, as long as I'm alive, I shall always keep my weapon pointed at you. With her bow pointed at the ground. But the dumbest moment by far is the conversation between Odin and Oswald in the Netherworld. When Oswald prepares to transform and strike the killing blow, Odin shouts, Wait, is this how you show your loyalty to the Fairy Queen? Yeah. What? kind of loyal subject would kill the leader of the enemy nation who instigated the war that resulted in countless deaths, stole the cauldron, had no mercy at the prospect of the fairy population's genocide as a result of overutilization of the cauldron, and killed the previous queen. One other little twist of irony is that Velvet is known as the Forest Witch, and Gwendolyn is known as Odin's witch, yet in gameplay, Mercedes has more cipher point skills than either of them, and Velvet actually has more POW skills than any other character. There's also one interesting tiny aspect of the story that I failed to notice until now. I always wondered why Oswald couldn't have a cool purple scythe or bladed gauntlets or something which in turn led me to wonder about the other characters' ciphers before suddenly realizing that their colors are indicative of their origins. The sword gifted to Titania originated in Ragnanival, with Griselda's spear and Odin's Baylor having been forged there as well. The ciphers are blue because the crystals Odin steals from the netherworld that can be seen all around Odette are blue. Meanwhile, Velvet's mother's chain was forged with the crystallization cauldron, which was snatched up by the fairies and used to create Elfario's bow and the Belder Reaver. The crimson color is due to the crystallization process referenced in Croy's memo regarding the Armageddon prophecies. This is how King Valentine knew that Mercedes's bow was forged in the cauldron even though the fairies seized it after his death. So yeah, that was my little delve into Odin Sphere's story. Got any thoughts of your own? Leave a comment down below. And if you like this brief look into the character of King Gallen and want to see more analyses of characters in video games, consider checking out King J. Grimm's channel and his In the Mind of series. Or if you'd like to see more in-depth retrospective looks at games, stories, gameplay, and development history, consider checking out Racevic's channel. Links to both in the description. And I've got other Odin Sphere videos if you're interested. Check out the description for links to those videos, as well as miscellaneous information, such as the names of songs used in this video, the sources of footage, etc.